welcome to MacroHive Conversations with Bilal Hafiz. MacroHive helps educate investors and provide investment insights for all markets from crypto to equities to bonds. For our latest views, visit MacroHive.com. Greetings and welcome, Ken, to the podcast show. It's great to have you on. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Happy to be here. Great. Now, before we go into the, the meat of our conversation, I do like to ask my guests something about their origin stories, um, you know, how, how they started or how you started your career in finance um, and then how that ended up taking you to where you are now running Graham Capital. Sure. Uh, you know, my career uh, really began around 1980 when I started working for Shearson uh, as a, an account executive. And uh Two or three years after I started at Shearson, uh, Dean Witter recruited me to uh, take over their fledgling hedge fund practice, which was more or less uh, allocating money to the early CTAs of that era. And I worked at Dean Witter from 82 to 89. And then in 1989, one of the CTAs who uh, we were a pretty big uh, investor with, and it was, it was John Henry, uh, talked to me about me moving to California, taking over his firm, and uh, I agreed to do so. So I left Dean Winter in 89, March of 89, to join Henry. And I moved uh, Henry's organization from California to uh, Connecticut. Uh, and then in 1994, or uh, yeah, thereabouts, uh, John and I saw things differently. I uh, left at the end of uh, 93 briefly retired. And then um, I uh, uh, tried to figure out what I was going to do next. Uh, I wasn't prepared to be retired. I was pretty young at the time, about 40. And uh, I met with Paul Jones and Mark Dalton from Tudor, and they encouraged me to start uh, my own fund. Uh, and they were interested in being a strategic partner and investor. So that's how Graham got started. That was in uh, June or July of 1994. And when we began trading, it was uh, based on uh, trading systems that I designed and developed in that period while I was retired. And uh, uh, that's how we got, uh, you know, first started in quantitative trading. And then in 1998, in an effort to diversify the sources of alpha that uh, Graham is able to uh, take advantage of, we began to build a discretionary business. Uh, also, with help from the Tudor organization, they uh, gave me uh, some traders that uh, uh, were um, not big enough for uh, Tudor to be uh, so, uh, uh, you know, um, involved in. And but they were a good place for me to start uh, our discretionary business. And ultimately, we hired a very, very successful Fed watcher named Fred Levin. Uh, sometime around, uh, I would say in 99 or something like that. And he turned out to just be an absolute fed fabulous trader and fed watcher. And he really, uh, I would say was the main catalyst for our, our early success in discretionary trading. Okay. That's a great, great story. I've got a bunch of questions, you know, first, you know, as you, as you had your career in the eighties, uh, as an account executive, then, uh, CTAs. I mean, what was it about that area of finance that attracted you? I mean, why did you stick to that? I mean, finance is quite a big industry. There's different areas sure. you go into, public markets, private markets, systematic, discretionary, and so on. What was it about that area that you knew, okay, that's the area you want to be in? Well, you know, there are a lot of, a lot of factors. I mean, the markets are pretty inefficient back then. So it was, uh, you know, uh, not unreasonable to uh, try and generate really high rates of return. And, uh, you know, it was a young industry and it's always exciting to be in a young industry that wasn't mature. Um, and, uh, you know, I can't say I woke up one morning and said, oh, God, this is exactly what I want to do. This, you know, what happens in people in their careers is you start focusing on something that you have a bit of an edge in. And I did because I was one of the early people in the field. And uh, I got to know most of the very successful traders uh, in the 80s and you know, it was an exciting business back then. Uh, there was a lot of inflation. Markets were volatile. Uh, you know, there was a lot of action uh, by various central banks. Currency volatility was huge. Commodity volatility was huge. So there was a lot going on, a lot to do. And and I found it, uh, you know, very compelling. Yeah, yeah. And and you said you started Graham in 1994. That, of course, was the period where Greenspan raised rates dramatically. We had the tequila crisis as well. 
I mean, was that a tough year to start in or did that turn out to be a good year to start yeah, in? As I, re as I recall, we kind of broke even our first six months. So I don't, I, I know it definitely wasn't easy. And then in 95, and I, I don't remember exactly what the market moves back then, uh, you'll forgive me, but that was almost 30 years ago, but we had a great 95 in our systems and that sort of got us going. Okay. And I can remember in the early days of the business, you know, it was so different uh, from today where, you know, the due diligence process by some very large institution or a sovereign wealth fund, you know, might take a year or two uh, before they decide to invest with you. Uh, I started uh, my hedge fund practice really with uh, the help of Tudor introducing to me some of their clients uh, that were Geneva-based banks who, based on their respect for, for Laurel Jones, uh, decided to give me a chance. So it was um, you know, it, it was quite interesting and quite different from what it is today. It was a, it was a smaller industry back then. And if you think about it, uh, the industry was really dominated by, uh, some of the fantastic, uh, discretionary macro traders of that era, uh, people that come to mind, obviously Paul Jones, phenomenal trader, then phenomenal trader today, you know, one of the, uh, you know, absolute brilliant minds in our business. But there were others, you know, Stan Druckenmiller, obviously really fabulous trader, both at Soros and, and at his own firm. Uh, you know, Bruce Kovner, really, really successful. Louis Bacon. Uh, and, and as I think about it, what made these people so successful was they generated, you know, pretty uh, exciting rates of return. Uh, and they were totally different from anything else that people invested in which was part of uh, the appeal is that you could have a source of alpha totally uncorrelated to stocks and bonds. Yeah. And actually on that point of diversification, uh, in your mind, I mean, how would you define macro? Because a lot of people now are sort of saying they're macro traders, which is convenient given the cycle we're in. But in your eyes, what, how would you define a macro strategy? Well, I would say that, you know, to me, macro is really about uh, trading in four asset classes, either directionally or from a relative value point of view. And that would be, you know, uh, equities, foreign exchange, fixed income and commodities. And there, you know, you could be trading any of those asset classes uh, on a short term basis, a long term basis, on a relative value basis, uh, a momentum basis. There are a lot of different um, ways to approach macro. But uh, I would say that it, it's a, it very typically is a directionally oriented strategy. And uh, uh, not that people don't use relative value a lot, they do. Um, but that, that to me is uh, traditional macro investing, uh, if you will. One of the appeals, one of the things about it that's really unique is if you look at the hedge fund industry, uh, you know, macro was the dominant style in the first decade or so of the hedge fund industry going back to say the eighties and nineties. And, um, you know, I think, I think the main reason for that was a, some of the very prominent people I mentioned had just had, you know, terrific success and, and unbelievable track records and were very charismatic and super bright, uh, people. Um, but also, uh, there was no correlation to stocks and bonds. And, you know, I think one of the reasons people came to invest in hedge funds early on was that, uh, you know, they were getting diversification from what they were, tra their traditional portfolio. And uh, hence the name hedge fund, right? Uh, is that it wasn't meant to be layering on more beta risk. It was meant to be diversifying from beta risk. So on that point of diversification, I mean, how do you think, um, you know, macro has done since the global financial crisis? Because obviously, from the global financial crisis up until say around COVID time, we had ultra low rates. Every every central bank in the in in the world had low rates, so that was yeah. a particularly unusual environment. So, how did macro fare in that environment, and how is today different from that period? Well, let's go back to all of the uh, crises that I can think of. Yeah, um, I'll start with the eighty seven market crash. I remember I was running uh, Dean Witter's hedge fund practice at that time. And uh, I can remember, uh, you know, that uh, my CTAs back then, if I recall correctly, 
uh, were caught wrong-sided in foreign exchange, but happened to be short equities because equities have been declining a little bit before October 19th of 1987. So they did well on some of those positions. And then uh, bonds really cratered, uh, yields really cratered. Bonds rallied a lot uh, on the Monday following the market crash. And uh, our CTAs got long fixed income and made a, 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 a made a lot of money. So it was an excellent diversifier in those very early days of the industry. Then I can remember in the 2000, uh, when, the, when the equity market and NASDAQ in particular cratered in the second quarter of 2000, uh, that was a great year for macro and particularly for CTAs in 2000, 2001, 2002, I even believe maybe 2003. Uh, and so, it, it, again, it was an example of where uh, it was an uncorrelated way of investing and therein lies, a, you know, quite a bit of a, the appeal. Uh, then, of course, we have to go to the 2008 and the financial crisis. Uh, and the second half of 2008 was a great period for macro and for CTAs. And, uh, you know, we, we generated really significant returns. And then I would say... Uh, from 2010 to 2021, it was a really quiet and somewhat dull period for macro. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, every central bank was easing um, and was more or less uh, not only easing, but giving forward guidance saying, um, we're, we're not going to raise rates uh, at the next meeting or two. And by the way, looking out 36 months, our forecast is we won't be raising rates. And so I can remember Fred Levin, the trader that I, I, I just mentioned earlier in our uh, conversation, that was when he decided to retire. He said, you know, <laughs> the Fed is basically telling me there's nothing to do for several years. I must well retire. And, uh, you know, so it was a quiet period. And it, one of the easiest ways, the most objective ways to kind of put some numbers on this is if you look at the period between 2010 July of 2010 and July of 2021, and you look at the three major central banks, the ECB, the Fed, uh, and the Bank of England, there were a total, a total of 13 25 basis point rate hike equivalent moves in 11 years by three central banks. Or put differently, there was an average of 1.2 hikes per year by three different central banks. If we look back, uh, to 2022, uh, there were just under 50 rate hikes of 25 basis points equivalent by those same three central banks. Or put differently, there was 30 times the amount of uh, action to work with as a macro trader in 22, as had been the case uh, in the previous 11 years. And so, you know, all of that easy monetary policy, the lack of inflation, uh, really sucked the volatility uh, out of macro. And conversely, since the, all the central banks have been moving, uh, there's so much more to work with for macro traders. And I think that's one of the reasons um, that uh, clients are more interested is, is there's, the opportunity set is, is so much more constructive uh, in an environment where central banks are, are, are moving a lot and there's heightened volatility in FX, there's heightened volatility Obviously, in rates, uh, there's heightened volatility in equities and and and, and somewhat in commodities. So there, there's, you know, our, our opportunity set is exponentially more interesting. And I, I guess that begs the question then, I mean, how long do you think this will last? Uh, you know, some people still have this view that we're going to go back to low rates, that this has just been a temporary burst of inflation, central banks will cut rates back to zero. Uh, obviously, the alternative view is, no, this is, you know, a different environment I now. Yeah, I think I think inflation is kind of like an ocean liner. It's hard to move around. It was really hard for them to create it. I think it's going to be not so easy for uh, inflationary pressures to ease back to a two percent target. I, I think you know inflation is coming down. We we see that in the data. But is it going to get back to two percent as fast as the market is expecting? I'm not confident that it will. Uh, and uh, moreover, there are already a number of hikes continue to be priced in, particularly in Europe, for the second half of this year. And then there are cuts priced in in the U.S. in the second half of this year, which I may not totally agree that they're going to happen. But, uh, you know, the, the, we're going to continue to see action. And so I, I, I think the, you know, the, we're going to continue to see 
somewhat heightened volatility in the asset classes that are important to macro for a while. Uh, and I, I say that based on a number of reasons. Uh, the supply chain bottlenecks are not completely resolved. The war in Ukraine is not resolved. You've got obviously more tension in Asia than you know any of us would like. Um, you've got a very uncertain political landscape heading into the 24 election. Uh, you know, you have um, uh, green energy policies in the U.S., uh, which we probably need to have, but nonetheless, they they are going to they're going to continue to uh, have some inflationary pressures that result, uh, you know, because of, of of the lack of development of energy in the in the U.S. And so, I think that um, for macro, maybe the next thirty six to sixty months continue to look really favorable. Yeah, and in terms of asset holders, you know, they've there's been a move for them to. Um, you know, one move to passive uh, over the years and uh, big allocations to uh, to, to equities, uh, slight moving away from bonds um, and a lot of allocations to private. Um, presumably going forward, there'll be more allocation to macro as a diversifier to the underlying portfolio. I, you know, I'd like to think so. I mean, I, I think if we, if we go back, you know, uh, uh, I would say that macro was probably half of the industry, maybe even the highest 70% of the industry in the 90s. And, and now it's more like 15 or 20% of the of, uh, the AUM and, and the hedge fund industry. If the hedge fund industry is roughly 4 trillion. You know, I would say CTAs and macro managers are probably six or 700 million of that amount. So maybe, maybe 15, 18%. Um, what I think is likely to happen this year is if we continue to see the opportunity set for macro to be pretty favorable, I think we're going to see clients uh, adjust upward their allocation. I don't think it'd be a sea change where people are going to triple or something, but I think people will probably, if their macro allocation is 10% of their portfolio, maybe it'll go to 15. I don't know. Uh, and if you, if you look at the, you know, uh, the way I think about it is that if I'm an investor and I have this very large uh, portfolio of beta and fixed income, right? And I'm in an environment now where there's some inflation and I'm, I, I personally think that something that's not priced in the market that, that eventually will be is duration risk. There's no term premium, right? The yield curve is inverted. So, you know, ultimately I'm kind of um, uncomfortable uh, if I'm a traditional investor uh, today looking ahead of a stock and bond portfolio, I think equities look really expensive. We can talk more about the market outlook in a minute, but I think equities look kind of expensive if you think we're heading towards a recession. And uh, and, and and fixed income, as we saw with SVB, right? I mean, uh, their duration risk wasn't properly priced. And that's why, you know, uh, essentially they went bankrupt is because they, they had a very large fixed income portfolio with a yield. It was a 10 10 percent 10 10 year average duration with a yield of one and a half percent in the current market's four or you know so um I think investors are uh, properly concerned about those issues and one of the ways that they can um diversify I think the most successfully is with really strong macro manager uh, you know funds whether it be quantitative or discretionary uh, because they're just not correlated yeah, and and in in terms of what gives a macro fund an edge, obviously you've been around. The Graham's been around for a long time. You've been around, you know, obviously before Graham, you know, Dean Witter, Henry, and so on. Um, you know, over your career, I mean, what you know, what do you feel gives um, a macro trader an edge, or what gives Graham an edge over other funds? Sure, I mean, I I think experience is is really a big deal, right? The fact that. You know, we've been doing this for 29 years. Uh, we've been through a lot of market cycles. We've been through different risk events. Uh, we've been through, uh, you know, issues such as counterparties failing. We've been through issues such as liquidity disappearing. Uh, you, I, if I were to give a, a conservative institution advice about what attributes to look for in a macro fund, I, I think you want experience. Uh, I think you want to have a, a strong management team, um, people that, you know, also have a lot of experience and are conservative, 
and are steady in how they want to manage the business through thick and thin, uh, you obviously need very talented people. I mean, we are in the alpha, we're in the business of producing alpha. You can only do that if you have the best people. How do you have the best people? Well, part of it's compensation, part of it's your culture. Are you a collaborative firm? Are you a place where people are happy? Uh, you know, is the culture of your organization compelling such that you not only attract really talented people, but you retain talented people? Uh, risk management's super important. Uh, we began in uh, 2007 during the mortgage crisis uh, that happened in the, in the fall of that year, and counterparties started getting you know, having difficult, uh, you know, uh, situations, depending on who you were dealing with, we started having a daily risk meeting at 930 every morning to look at um, every trader's positions, liquidity and counterparty risks and stress tests. And we've continued that discipline now for 13, 14 years, where at 930 every day, including today, I was on our risk meeting, looking at P&L from yesterday, every trader's position, is anyone having difficulty? Is there anything that we need to be concerned about? And so on and so forth. And I think the consistency of, of having that very hands-on risk management approach is a, is a real, uh, adds great value uh, over the long haul. It's not in any given moment. It's that over time, you're hopefully going to manage risk more successfully because you're just more attentive to it. I, I, I think one of the other things that's been really important to me as I manage Graham is the diversification of the sources of alpha internally at Graham. You know, I don't want to be a one trick pony. Uh, I don't want to only make money when it's good for momentum and quantitative trading. I want to be able to make uh, a return uh, when, uh, you know, uh, maybe value is a more attractive factor than momentum. So we, that's why we built our discretionary trading business 24 years ago. And more recently, we got involved in long-term quantitative equities trading. And, you know, we, we are always on the hunt for sources of alpha that aren't correlated uh, to what we're already doing and where we feel that we have an edge and it's uh, synergistic with our core business. Um, I think, finally, I would say uh, to run a firm successfully over three decades or, or what have you, you know, you want more or less uh, to be strategically innovative and creative because uh, there's no way you can do what worked 10 years ago and expect it to always work in the future. You've always got to be looking for uh, more innovative, more creative ways, uh, more inventive uh, opportunities to find new sources of value. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, on, on diversification, like within the firm, I mean, one set, set up of hedge funds is the pod shop approach, the platform approach. Um, yeah. You know, many, many big named uh, funds have that structure. Um, what's your thoughts about that type of structure? And have, have you thought about setting up, you know, restructuring Graham in, in kind of a pod shop style? You know, we've thought about it. I think, uh, you know, first of all, we give, you know, great credit and respect to the most successful of those firms. Um, and we're, you know, very respectful of uh, just how institutional they are and, 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 the, and the consistency of their performance. I think our clients, some of them are uncomfortable with a pass-through fee structure uh, because it, the costs end up getting pretty high. Uh, and, and, and I think the, you know, some of the most successful funds are now asking clients to lock up for five years and so on and so forth. So. That's also unappealing to some investors, uh, but I think you have to respect the net return that the, so the best of those firms have, have accomplished. Uh, we are we have started our own uh, version of a macro focused multi strat fund, and uh, you know we're we're finding that clients are interested in it. They're watching it. Some are investing, uh, and I think over time it will be an important part of our business. Uh, and at the end of the day we want to compete for the top talent and in order to do that having a fund with the same economics as some of our most successful competitors is you know is, is part of what uh you know is, is something that we is essential uh, it's to compete for the top people and you talked about uh, innovation earlier as well and 
obviously we're hearing a lot about AI at the moment uh, in all sorts of different ways, chat GPT and so on. Um, and of, of course, Graham has a whole history of quantitative approaches. I mean, do you, could you imagine like AI replacing humans at some point in the investment process? Or is there something still that humans have that AI can't, can't deliver on? Well, I, I think it's, it's, hard to know right i mean it's it's hard to believe uh just how uh impressive some of this artificial intelligence uh really is uh i was astonished we we asked that you know that uh, software chat to uh write a song about trend following and it wrote a magnificent set of verses about tre trend following capturing the essence of how trend following works and when it works and how it works. I was, I was blown away. So, it, it, you know, I don't want to predict that uh, it's going to replace humans uh, in terms of strategic judgment. And uh, I think there's an edge that humans have that is hard to replicate. But I also don't want to underestimate artificial intelligence. It's, pr it's pretty powerful. Yeah. And, you know, we, we did touch on market views earlier, but um, you know, what, what are your current market thoughts? You, you know, on equities, you thought equities are expensive, for example. I mean, what, uh, let's start with equities and then go through the different markets. Sure. So, you know, equities to me seem expensive if you think that we're likely to head into a recession, uh, which I think is the base case view of most economists over the next nine months or so. So, you know, uh, maybe the, the Fed will engineer a soft landing, but you know, the more probable case is that, you know, we, uh, you know, what, what we see happening in technology layoffs and all these firms shrinking, uh, you know, is going to ultimately uh, lead to a contraction in earnings. And so with forward PEs, one year PE now just under 19, that seems high to me. Uh, should we normalize at 16 or 17? I would think so. So, uh, you know, it remains to be seen what the economy does, but I, I would lean towards being short equities. I also think that uh, if you think about what drove equities higher, it really is the Tina phenomenon. There is no alternative. Mm -hmm. And now there is an alternative. Now you can make four or 5% in risk free rates. Uh, you couldn't do that for uh, the previous decade. So I, I think a, a combination of, uh, you know, contraction in earnings, contraction in the economy, and there is a, a a very appealing alternative of a four or five percent risk free rate. Uh, that that makes me want to be, uh, you know, a little negative equities. It's not lost on me, however, that the psychology of the investor is so powerful, and the psychology of the investor for the last fifteen years is buy every dip, and you were rewarded uh, for doing so, and if you didn't do that, you were punished. And that psychology probably hasn't changed yet. And that's why I think the stocks are performing well right now, is that the psychology of the investors still is inclined to think, let, let me think of a reason to buy equities. And the current reason is the Fed pretty close to done. So uh, that should be good for stocks. But I think if, in fact, the economy con contracts uh, the way most economists believe it will, that's not so good for stocks. So I, I on balance, uh, you know, think that equities probably the decline from current levels. Um, dollar, I think the dollar looks a little weak to me. Uh, the euro's trying to break out above 110. Uh, I think, you know, uh, the perception in the marketplace, this is not a strong trend. It's it's one that looks to maybe be developing because we had a strong dollar, right, for the last, uh, you know, 15 months or whatever. But I, I think the perception is the ECB is now more hawkish than the Fed. And uh, so, you know, the dollar looks slightly weak as we sit here today. Um, if you look at the yield curve, first, uh, broadly about fixed income, I think rates are priced about right. Um, how, having said that, uh, I think the yield curve should steepen more. It's, it's already steepened some. It was as, you know, it was inverted as much as two cents were 100 basis points inverted. Now it's about 60. Uh, I would look for that to steepen as the economy indeed goes into a recession. Um, and I also think, that, you know, if you look at what happened with Silicon Valley Bank, that, you know, that they, people totally forgot about something called duration risk uh, and that you should get paid more. For, you should have term premium for taking duration risk. And, and there is no premium right now, obviously, there, uh, for duration risk. So 
in fixed income, I, that's the more interesting play to me is do we, do we begin to see uh, some continued uh, steepening of the yield curve? Uh, finally, uh, you know, uh, I would say there, I think the market's slightly optimistic on cuts, particularly in the U.S. happening in this uh, third and fourth quarter. Uh, I'm not convinced the Fed's going to be able to do that. Um, you know, maybe, but uh, I think that the market's a little bit optimistic there. It's not a big mispricing, but uh, I'm not convinced we'll, we'll be cutting this year. And uh, there's about 30 or 40 basis points of cuts priced in this in the last quarter of the year. And do you think we'll get some kind of crisis? See, we, we had the me SVB regional bank crisis. We had the LDI issue in the UK last year. We've had crypto blow up. So we've had these blow ups, like mini blow ups. Um, I mean, do you think we'll see a, a big blow up like 08 in some way or, or is it just a different environment that we're in? Yeah, I don't I don't think we'll see an 08 style crisis, uh, although we came pretty close to two weeks ago, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, uh, with a run on banks and if the Fed hadn't, I think the Fed response was pretty good. Um, and uh, so I give credit to them for, for um, you know, really uh, managing that uh, pretty effectively. But uh, I don't know. I mean, we got the debt ceiling, uh, you know, negotiation that it's always ugly until it isn't right. So uh, we'll have to keep an eye on that. Uh, I think the political situation is interesting. I think the Ukrainian thing uh, is nowhere near a resolution. Uh, so I, I think there are a lot of risk factors out there, but I, I, I don't see uh, a crisis, you know, tomorrow. But, you know, you, you have to be vigilant. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, more generally, um, in terms of the longer term growth potential of the U.S., just just like five, 10 year view. I mean, do you think that the U.S. still is like the dominant economic power? Or do you think I mean, there's a lot of talk about all the political gridlock in the U.S. and a lot of negativity around that, um, you know, but in terms of the economic potential, I mean, what, 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 you know, do you think the U.S. still will be kind of the dominant economic power? Well, I think we're, we're going to be up there. I mean, I, for all of our challenges, uh, particularly in politics, uh, where, you know, it's hard to find somebody in the middle who's in power, right? It's either the far left or the far right. But, uh, you know, I, uh, I think Europe also has issues and Asia has issues. So uh, I think the U.S. stays very competitive. Yeah. And, um, you know, earlier we touched on the talent Um you know, what advice would you uh, give to budding macro traders or macro sort of portfolio managers? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 there's plenty I could offer them. I mean, I think one of the things that troubles me is that, you know, young people don't have uh, access to mentors the way I did throughout my career. You know, my career is 45 years and, 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 uh, over that period of time, I've been fortunate enough to work with some really inspirational people. So I think that if I were to give advice to uh, a 25 year old who's getting out of, uh, you know, university or business school, I would be try and try and work closely with somebody who really inspires you with their intellect and their talent. Um, I, I think uh, that is uh, such a valuable thing to uh, to, to one's career development. It, it's, I had mentors, you know, uh, Paul Jones was a, an enormous inspiration to me, but there were others earlier in my career, Dean Witter and so on. And I, you know, I, I had the privilege of working with, uh, and getting to know really talented people who became macro manager superstars. Uh, and I, I think there is an intangible value that I, I, I would, would really, uh, suggest to people, uh, you know, not easy to do, but to, 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 you know, it, it's not impossible to work in an organization where you're surrounded by talented people. I, I think uh, I've always given the advice to, you know, uh, people who've worked for me over the last four decades. Um, Attitude is important. Show up first, leave last, never be on the computer screwing around and have a smile on your face and a positive frame of mind. And you're going to get noticed. Uh, and if you do the opposite, that's not all that helpful to your career. Yeah, no, that's great. That's great advice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just 
Um, I, I would also on the mentor side, I, I also find that mentors are happy to be approached to be mentors as well. Um, so young people, I think, shouldn't feel like they're imposing. Uh, the, the worst case is they say no, but often exactly. I think mentors feel quite honored to be a mentor. Yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's situational, you know, the right time and place. Uh, that, uh, but, you know, um, I think if if one searches out uh, inspiration, you can find it. Hmm. You just have to look for it. Um, sometimes I feel that, like you asked me a question about how about attracting talent. Sometimes you find talent where other people aren't looking. I mean, if you fish in the same pond as everybody else, obviously it's going to be thinner for opportunities than if you're creative and you're innovative about how you find people. And so I think that's part of the solution as well, is that you've got to uh, be open-minded uh, about you know where you're going to find the next generation of, of successful uh, people to work in your firm. And uh, you know, on that topic, obviously over COVID, we had all the work from home dynamics um, and some of that remains with us. I mean, have you sort of changed your view on different work practices since we've had the experiment of COVID? Yeah, you know, we have a hybrid approach at Graham of, uh, you know, three and two. Uh, and I, you know, I, I'm i uh, grudgingly accepting of it. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I prefer, I think we're stronger when we're all together, but I also re recognize that some people have long commutes they feel are much more productive when they can work from home and you know, don't have to spend time commuting, which is inefficient, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I, you know, we we are going to more or less do what most other successful hedge funds do, which is have some sort of hybrid approach where people can collaborate in person, which I feel is a more effective way to collaborate. And we'll continue to do Zoom and the other things we do to work remotely and, you know, manage through it all. That's great. Um, and, and then the last question I wanted to ask you was on books. You know, I'm, I love reading books. I mean, what are, what are the sort of books that have really influenced you over your career? Or, or, or well, even I, it took come right to mind that I think uh, anybody who uh, wants to become a portfolio manager trader, you, you got to read Reminiscence of a Stock Operator, Laferve, and uh, you've got to read Jack uh, Schwager's, uh, you know, Market Wizards and the interviews with all the top traders. I think you had two or three editions of that book with different traders over the years that's a very good starting place yeah no that's great uh yeah so with that uh you know what's the best way for people to learn a bit more about graham or, or your or yourself uh well i i think visit our office in connecticut is a very good uh place to learn about us obviously our website is uh pretty accessible to people linkedin and so on and uh you know contact our investor relations uh, people and, and and they'll organize a meeting with you know, whether it be our risk manager or our CEO or our CIO and, uh, you know, and, and, and get to know us, it's, it's pretty straightforward. We, we pride ourselves on being easy to work with for clients, um, you know, and being really transparent and open because I, that's how I want to be treated if I'm a client. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so with that, thanks a lot, uh, Ken. That was a really enlightening conversation, and it's great to speak to someone, uh, you know, as uh, legendary as you are in, uh, oh, in the macro world. Fine. It's, it's totally my pleasure, Bilal, and, you know, thank you for your interest. And, uh, you know, I, I leave you with this thought. I, I, I think, look, do I, I, I don't know that the markets are going to be as um, amazingly good for macro as they were in 22 in the next two, three years, but I think they're going to be a lot more interesting than they were in the previous decade, and that ought to be good enough, particularly if we continue to be non-correlated to everything else people invest in. And we're also generating, uh, you know, returns that are, you know, pretty attractive and 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 dissimilar in terms of how they happen. So, you know, that's, I'm, I'm really uh, optimistic um, about the market opportunity set and, you know, excited to, to do what we do. No, that's great. I, I agree as well. Yeah, well, thanks a lot and, and good luck for the for the rest of this year and the next few years. Thank you very much, Bilal. Great. You're very well. Have okay. a good day. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the episode. Please subscribe to the podcast show on Apple, Spotify, or if you listen to podcasts, leave a five-star rating, a nice comment, and let other people know about the show. We'd be super grateful. Finally, sign up for our free newsletter at macrohive.com forward slash free. That's macrohive.com forward slash free. We'll be back soon, so tune in then.